Let's pray. O Lord of the harvest, water the hearts of those who hear your word in this hour. Cause me and all those who hear me to behold you in the light of faith right now so that we can behold you in the fullness of glory soon hereafter. O Lord God, as I preach, may I exalt you and humble sinners. O God, do your work of grace in all of our hearts so that the seed which is sown in weakness may be raised in God's mighty power through Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Do you know what time it is in God's glorious plan for the future? You know, knowing exactly what time it is is a relatively new experience for human beings. The first uh, reliable, affordable watch was not invented and produced until the 1860s. That's not that long ago. I ran into an interesting concept this week, an article by Catherine Miller of BuzzFeed News titled, How the 2010s Have Broken our sense of time. The subtitle of that article is How the Rhythms of American Life Changed in the 2010s. How everything from TV to Trump to Instagram has so messed with your head that now you feel like time has melted. And as I read this article, I became convinced that time really has kind of melted for us in the 2010s. Time used to move. Time used to move the same for everyone, right? talk television, at least from the 50s all the way through the 90s, we all tuned in to view something at the exact same time. This article located the peak of that in 1996 when the finale of the television drama ER aired. Some some, uh, 35 million plus American households tuned in at the exact same time. You know, time no longer works like that. With the possible exception of sporting events, but many of us don't even watch those live anymore unless we buy a ticket and go. With the possible exception of sporting events, we just don't experience time the same anymore. The way it works now is you turn on your device and the algorithms place in front of you what the device thinks you most want to view. Whether it's live or whether it happened 10 seconds ago, or whether it happened 10 minutes ago, or whether it happened 10 days ago. It's presented to you right now in your own controlled time. This leads to, interesting phrase from this article, this leads to a non-linear acceleration. This leads to a non-linear acceleration where everything is always moving and it's always going faster, but it's melting this way and that pushed forward, pulled back, up, down, sideways, diagonal, and that really is the case. It feels like time has melted because of our personalized platforms and everything has become warped. But let me tell you, in this service of worship, let me tell you for certain that time has not melted. Time has not become personalized. Time is the same for each and every soul in the universe, and time is ticking toward God's appointed end, when God and God alone will decide when time ceases at its appointed moment and God and God alone inaugurates the state of eternity. If you'd open with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. This is the beginning of a two-week series on uh, living hope or we might say Esperanza Viva. The glorious plans that God has for the future. This is a two-week series on end times. Uh, This week, I want to lay out uh, why 
we sometimes neglect studying this and why we need to understand this. And then next week, uh, I'll lay out for you as well as I as good as, as well as I can a uh, a uh, timeline of future events. We'll read from Second uh, Peter chapter three when we talk about end times in systematic theology. It's called eschatology simply because eschaton is the Bible word for last. This is the doctrine of last things. Second Peter chapter three. Peter says, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring you up. I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through the apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from since the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. Beloved. Beloved saints of Racine Bible Church, do not overlook this one fact, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Beloved, don't overlook this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come and it'll come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will all be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Beloved, time is hastening toward the second coming of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, time is cascading toward a conclusion. And let me tell you this, the conclusion of time will be glorious and it will be decisive. The conclusion of time will be glorious. Just listen to the words of glory that Jesus narrated it with in uh, Matthew 24. Jesus said this, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon won't give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken and then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. Jesus says the conclusion of time will be glorious. It'll be glorious. And let me tell you also, it will be decisive. There will be no eh, ish about it. It will be decisive. The key reference here is 1 Corinthians 15, a two long paragraphs where he talks about the end, but he has this, this marvelous phrase that Christ, God, will bring all things to culmination and it says this in 1 Corinthians 15, and then the end will come. And then the end 
will come. It will be decisive because world history will come to a close. God's plan of redemption will be culminated. All of God's enemies will be judged. All of those who have been mercifully saved by God will be forever glorified and the end will come decisively. So this is what we want to talk about. And this morning, I want to tell you maybe why we neglect it to our peril and why we need it. And next week, I'll try to talk more specifically about the timing of end times events. First, why do we neglect it? Well, we neglect it because the world around us neglects it. Second Peter 3 says, scoffers will come and say, what are you talking about? The world is driving toward a conclusion. What are you talking about? Everything is continuing the same as it always ever was. Many unbelievers, uh, part of their unbelief is that they refuse to believe that the cosmos has a telos. One of the things they refuse to believe is that the world has a point, that the world has a momentum, that there is a divine clock running the universe. Many even who call themselves Christians don't aggressively and actively believe that God is holding time in his hand and working all things to the conclusion of his will. Some Christians are even jettisoning the belief that God will return and judge. But the fact that God will return and judge and the fact that God himself will open up hell and hell will be hot and forever is not something that the church can choose to no longer want to talk about. This is what God has revealed to us. The earliest rejections of Christianity had this to do with them. In Acts 17, one of the earliest gospel presentations, Paul preaches the gospel and he emphasizes Christ's return and the resurrection. And as soon as Paul's words end, the very next words are, and so the crowd began to mock him. Don't be surprised that the world mocks hell and heaven and the resurrection. That's no surprise. That's no surprise to us. Listen, church, listen. We believe what the world does not believe. And so we're, we're, we're not expecting the world to take it seriously, but let us not hope the world expects us to mute our witness according to their flavor of the month. Maybe the best the world will do is make a movie that's themed on the apocalypse and they'll work really hard to get the special effects amazing. But they won't take it seriously. And they'll mock us if we talk about hell and heaven and the coming judgment. I expect that. I, who would I be if I was courting the world's favor and every time the world mocked me, I tried to uh, end around it and quit talking about whatever it is they're mocking. This is not, this is, th this is not what the church does. But not only does the world not believe it, even in the church, we seem to sort of let go of it. One reason we let go of it is because it's so complex. I mean, it's, there's a lot to think through about, uh, certainly about the timing of end times event, but there's a lot to think through about the, the eternal, conscious punishment be beholding the wrath of God in hell for those we know and those we love. This is very complex. It's hard. And there are so many details of the events of end times that we have to kind of piece together. It's very complex. And another reason we avoid it, I guess, is because it's somewhat controversial because we see godly teachers disagreeing. I, if, I, if, if you force me to lay out like my four favorite Bible teachers it would probably be the case that none of them agrees with the rest of them about the timing of end times events. It's, this is controversial and, and even good Bible-believing Christians who carefully interpret scripture interpret things differently. But these are not good reasons to avoid the study of eschatology. We ought to study it. By some, by some counts, one verse out of five deals with eschatology. One verse out of five in fact, when we were putting together our Advent booklet that uh, you, you're going to be going through, Lord willing, in the month of December, the first, I wrote the, I wrote the first one, and it's on um, uh, Genesis 3.15, the first prophecy 
of the coming of Christ. And then I was assigned to write the last one, which is from Revelation 21, the final return of Christ. This is Christ's story, and it begins and it ends with his second coming. So why do we need this? Why do we need this living hope? Let me give you, as far as an outline this morning, four or five reasons why we need this. Reason number one, the word of God demands it. That's pretty simple. The word of God demands it. From Genesis 3.15 to Malachi 4 verse 2 in the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament is filled with prophecies of Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. Of the more than 100 prophecies of Christ's first advent, they were fulfilled literally in his first coming. How often in the New Testament do you read this phrase? that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that the, pro- that the word of the prophets might be fulfilled. All of them were fulfilled in his first coming and there's still all these prophecies of his second coming and he has to come back the way the Bible says he's gonna come back so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. The word of God demands it. The promises and covenants of God to Israel demand it. I take... Uh, Romans 11, and you'll see this next week when I lay out the the order that I believe, the order that I believe is, is, uh, I guess you'd call it premillennial, that God's going to uh, literally fulfill his promises to Israel in an earthly millennium. I take that from Romans 11, from Zechariah 12, from lots of places like Isaiah 2 in the Old Testament where God makes these promises to Israel. They haven't been fulfilled yet, but Jesus will fulfill them when he returns and he reigns from a throne in Jerusalem. Why do we need this? Well, first, because the word of God demands it. That's the first reason. But there's a second reason, and it's this. The corruption of the world demands it. The corruption of the world demands it. God writes his pure, holy book of scripture, and it demands that Christ return But even in that pure and holy book of scripture, it says time and time again that the corruption of this world demands that Jesus return on a war horse. The corruption of this world demands it. This world is a very wicked place. I like uh, Louis Armstrong. I was listening to him yesterday but I just can't vibe with the fact that this is a wonderful world. It's going to be one, but it ain't that yet. This world is a wicked place. This life is hard. And one of the most common, I mean, I'll call it a prayer, but really it's just a gasp from God's children. One of the most common gasps from God's children is, how long? How long? How long? When is the last time that you despaired at the depravity and cruelty and injustice and iniquity that you see around you and you said, Lord, how long? Many of our precious church members have been sinned against in grotesque ways. And the one who perpetrated the sin against them has not yet been held to account. How long? How long? How long? We say with the psalmist, I am weary with crying and my throat has become parched. My eyes, my my eyes have grown dry, the psalmist says, with crying, how long? More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me. I am surrounded, the psalmist says, by those who trample on the innocent and shed their blood with impunity. How long, how long, how long, O oh Lord, how long? Hear me say this from this pulpit with this Bible open. In the name of Jesus, who testified the good word before Pontius Pilate and who has risen from the dead, hear me tell you that things will not always be this way. And our cry of how long will be answered because Jesus will say, long enough, my children, long enough. I'm back to make all things new. Injustice will cease 
Every abuser will receive the judgment that is due them. This is why we need eschatology, because the corruption of this world demands it. Matthew 16, 27, when the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father with his angels, he will recompense every man according to his deeds. It will be decisive, it will be universal, and no one will escape. John 5, 28 and 29, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice. When those who perpetrate injustice seem to get away with it and they live a pretty good life and then they die, death does not deliver them from what is due them. It says in John 5, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, but those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment. We hear that and we wait for God's loving righteousness to be vindicated. And as we wait amid the corruption of the world, let me hasten to add to point number two, point number three, because it has to be nestled up right up next to it. And point number three is, the reason why we need this, point number three is this, so that we can warn and reach those who are headed for the wrath of God. So that we can warn and reach those who are headed for the wrath of God. You see, the corruption of this world demands that Christ return. But we need this because we want to warn and reach those who are headed for the wrath of God. Oh, we long for injustice and evil to be judged. How long? How long, O oh Lord? But we love sinners. And we want that how long to stretch at least long enough for us to reach those sinners with the message of Jesus' love so that they can be saved from the wrath which is coming, and it is coming. We have to put this third point together with that second point because biblical, biblical eschatology does not teach that the story ends well for everyone. Biblical eschatology exists as a frightening warning to those who have refused to believe in Jesus as Savior that there is an eternal punishment coming for them that they have earned and merited. Banishment from God's kingdom and from the presence of God and from God's people. As wonderful and as blessed as heaven is, as wonderful and blessed as heaven is, there's also scarce any exaggerating how woeful and miserable hell will be. Those who are saved will receive a crown that never fades. But those who die without salvation will have a worm that does not die out. Those who are saved will receive a glorious inheritance that never fades away. But those who are not saved will be in a fire that shall never be quenched. And so we warn, and so we warn. Paul warned them in Acts 17. He said, repent and believe, for God has given you this day to repent and believe before Jesus returns to judge all things. That's what he said in, in, in his wonderful gospel demonstration in, in Acts chapter 17. Listen to how Jesus puts it in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 you know, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then it says in John 3, 18, Whoever believes in the Son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in the Son is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true and comes to the light, it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. And John 3 ends with this sobering statement. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. These are warnings about the wrath of God. And serious passages that warn us about the wrath of God are painful and frightening. They can be hard to take emotionally. And yet, 
they should motivate us because there is an avenue of escape from wrath available. That is Jesus Christ, the Savior. I was reading from Isaiah last week. You don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 34, it says, the Lord is enraged against the nations and furious against their hosts. The Lord has devoted the nations to destruction and given them over to slaughter. Isaiah 34 says, the slain of the nations shall be cast out and the stench of their corpses will rise and the mountains shall flow with their blood and all the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies will roll up like a scroll and the host shall fall and the sword will be drunk with blood as it falls from the heavens. Passages like this are, are frightening and they're difficult. I was so kind of torn up by that passage, I looked up a commentary that helped me understand the Hebrew. And it actually says there, the Hebrew expression there is, you know how a, you know how a river can carve in a, in a hill or in a mountain? A river can carve its own way over time. The Hebrew there says, when God returns, the blood of the slain will flow so thick that a that a new channel will be carved in the mountains. Say, well, that's poetic imagery of the Bible. Well, fine, it's a metaphor. But it is a metaphor imaging for us something that is real. And I, I tell you with a broken heart, I tell you the reality will be worse than any image or metaphor could make it seem. This is the reality that's coming. And the Old Testament prophets and the greatest New Testament teacher, Jesus, did not lower their voices when it came to the doctrine of hell and God's wrath and God's judgment. They didn't mince words about it. How, how could they dare mince words about it? Because it is so real. The one thing they want to do is warn those who are here to flee from the wrath to come. This is the gospel we declare to you now. If you're here and you, don't, and you haven't yet received the gospel, repent and flee from the wrath of God by sheltering under the Savior who has taken the wrath of God in your place. But you must trust him as Savior and you must follow him as Lord. This is the way of escape. So that's what we understand. It's so that we can warn those who are headed for the wrath of God. But there's a fourth reason why we need this. That third reason is kind of about our mission going out. The fourth and fifth reason are kind of about our, our mindset and our lifestyle within. The fourth reason is this, so that we have a proper perspective on today. That's why we need this. So that we have a proper perspective on today. The only way to have a proper perspective on today is to see all the way to the end. The only way to have a proper perspective on today is to see all the way to the end. Fact, we live in a tragedy-filled world. Fact, every one of us is physically decaying and dying. Fact, evil seems to triumph in new ways every hour. Given those facts, here's the concluding question. Why aren't Christians hopeless and overwhelmed and despairing? Given those facts, here's the concluding question. Why aren't Christians hopeless and overwhelmed and despairing? And the answer is because Christians believe that God will bring all things to their appointed end. We have a doctrine of eschatology which gives us hope. Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. That verse has two halves of the seesaw. And the more you let the sufferings of this present time overwhelm you is because the less you understand the glory that is yet to be revealed. Don't ignore that glory that's to be revealed. The coming of Jesus and the restoration of all things is what gives Christians hope. The turmoils and trials of this age will not last forever. Probably every week, 
Somebody gets here on Sunday and at some point during the last week, they didn't even know if they would make it through the week. The trials and the turmoils are so difficult, but they will not last forever. Christians need this message. Christians live for the line, not the dot. Christians live for the heavenly banquet so we don't, like a serpent, lick the dust of the earth. We don't live for that. Read a sermon from A.W. Tozer on End Times. Listen to this. Man, this is what Tozer said, what, 60 years ago? The church must claim again her ancient dowry of everlastingness. The church must begin again to deal in ages and millenniums rather than days and years. The church must cease counting numbers and start testing foundations. The church must work for permanence rather than for appearance. Her children must seek those enduring things that have been touched with immortality. And he concludes with this, the shallow brook of popular Christianity chatters on its nervous way and thinks the ocean is all too quiet and dull because in its deep, mighty bed, it is unaffected by the latest rain shower. Christians need to reclaim their ancient dowry of everlastingness. So instead of every shower just filling us or emptying us, we have the depth of an ocean that is unaffected by current events. The only way to to have this is by grasping God's glorious plans for eternity. I don't want to teach you about the end times in some sort of shallow way that that locates uh, like... Bernie Sanders is not the Antichrist, okay? And the current impeachment proceedings were not prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. This is not what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get you to see as the whole world runs around like that, we have an ocean of of the sovereign promises of God and we we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we know what's going to happen on the only day that matters. And so forth. This is the only way to have proper perspective on today. And then fifth, fifth, and I want you to take this to heart, so that we will be watchful and ready. So that we will be watchful and ready. This is in that whole cluster of parables that Jesus tells in Matthew 24 and 25. He tells all these stories of servants or of engaged ladies, or different people like that being left to wait until the husband or the leader of the home or whoever it is comes back to get them. And Jesus keeps saying, watch therefore, watch therefore, and don't, uh, don't be lulled to sleep, and, 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 and don't, um, don't forget that the master is coming back. Listen to how Jesus says in Matthew 24, I'm reading from uh, Matthew 24 and verse uh, 42. Matthew 24 and verse 42. Jesus says, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. Matthew 24, verse 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. He goes on to tell another story right after that. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? That's what I want you to be, faithful and wise. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he returns. Truly I say to you, he'll be set over all his possessions. But if the wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, and so begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that house will come on a day when that servant does not expect and in an hour when that servant does not know and will cut him in pieces. 
and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We need this so that we will be watchful and ready and sober, so that we'll stay faithful and ready and reverent and obedient because we don't know when Jesus is returning, so we don't have time to, 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 to live in drunkenness and in disobedience and in faithlessness. We don't know when he's coming back. This week, I came home at an hour when our dog, Chester, did not expect. Let me tell you the story. Uh, one of our cars has auto start. One of them doesn't. Guess which one? Amy drives. I, I believe in male headship and I believe that the, the husband's headship is demonstrated in him giving everyone in the house everything good and him taking the, the nasty leftovers. I really believe that. So Amy was already gone in the car with auto start. It was freezing outside. So I went outside to turn on the car and get it warmed up. Well, when I went outside with my briefcase, Chester thought, he, he's leaving for the work day. He ain't going to be back for eight hours. So when the time it took me to go out, start the car, and walk back in, Chester was already in the trash, and he pulled out all the chicken bones all over the living room. That dog thought I was gone for eight hours. He didn't know when I was coming back. And, and uh, it, he was pretty much like, like, like the guy in uh, Matthew 24. There were no other servants for him to beat, but he was eating and drinking with the drunkards. That dog was drunk on chicken bones. And he's just, and I, I walk in the door and he's like, I didn't expect you at this hour. <laughs> I did not cut him into pieces, but I did beat him. And I placed him in a place where he wept. I'll tell you that. <laughs> In the Gospels and in pretty much every one of the epistles, Jesus in the Gospels and the writers of each of the epistles cement personal holiness with expectation of Christ's return. Personal holiness with expectation of Christ's return. The most classic text on this is 1 John 3, verse 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 John 3, verse 1 says, this is how the Father has loved us. He's made us children of God. And then 1 John 3, verse 2 says, beloved, we're God's children now, but what we shall be has not yet appeared. For when he appears, we will be like him, for we'll see him as he is. The expectation of Christ's appearing. And then verse 3 says, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. Hope in Christ's return is the root of purity. Hope in Christ's return is cemented to your personal holiness. I'm asking you this. Think of, I don't want to talk to the whole church. I want to talk to you, singular, each individual one of you. And I just want to ask you this question, and you have the right to ask me this question. Where is the impurity in your life? Where is the impurity in your life? Is it in your deeds? You're just flat out doing deeds that you know are sinful. Is it in your thought life? Maybe anger, which Jesus says is equivalent to murder. Maybe lust, sexual impurity. Maybe it's in your thought life of bitterness and unforgiveness which Jesus says, if you're a habitually bitter and unforgiving person, how can you claim to have been forgiven in the first place? Where is the impurity in your life? Maybe it's in self-loathing and self-pity. Maybe it's in an unbelief that wallows in guilt too much. Maybe it's in an unbelief that presumes on the gospel too much and sins all the time. Where is the impurity in your deed or in your thought? Where is the impurity in your life? Hear this verse again. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Maybe, maybe I've been making a mistake and in trying to get you to let go of impurity, the only thing you've heard me say is uh, stop sinning, sin is bad, stop sinning, sin is bad. 
And maybe that hasn't worked. And maybe you feel stuck in your sin. Here, here, purity is the moral effect of Christian hope in Christ. So set your hope on Christ and let that purify you. Consider the imminent return of Christ and let that purify you. This is my bottom line point how seriously you take the elimination of impurity in your life is indexed to how seriously you take the return of Jesus Christ. If you are having trouble letting go of impurity in your life, I promise you, you are having commensurate trouble living as if Christ is going to return and this world isn't all there is. Impure people live as if Christ is not returning and this world is our only shot at pleasure and a good time. Those who live lives of holiness and purity always do so because they believe in the soon return of Jesus Christ. How seriously you take the elimination of sin in your life, how seriously you take the cultivation of purity in your life is indexed to how authentically you're watching for the return of Jesus, how seriously you take the return of Jesus. If Jesus is not returning, then have all the chicken bones you want. If Jesus is not returning, why not be a drunkard? If Jesus is not returning, why not this, why not that, why not the other thing? If Jesus is not returning. But beloved, if... Jesus is returning. You best kill your sin swiftly, mercilessly, and decisively. This is why Romans 13 says, awake, the time of Christ's return is nearer than when we believed. And it says, make no provision for the flesh. Get jettison anything out of your life that you have to because Jesus is returning how seriously you take the elimination of sin in your life is indexed to how seriously you take the return of Jesus Christ. Are you longing for his appearing? Or are you lulled to sleep and time has melted and everything just keeps going like it was? Live with the end in view. This will motivate you to live today and tomorrow, and in the moments and hours that remain in your life, like Jesus is returning, and like Jesus is altogether worthy. Let's pray. I'll just give you a moment to pray. Maybe just to thank God for reminding you of what time it is. Thanking God for the promise of his word. Thank him for what you've heard. And as you thank him for it all comes from him, here's the important thing. As you intend to change your life and obey, ask him, ask him to help you. Not by might, not by human strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Say, Lord, I want to live a life of purity and holiness. I want to change my thought life. God, would you, would you help me? Would you change my heart? Would you fix my gaze? Will you give me the courage to mortify and cut out of my life the things that I know I need to let go of? Father, hear your children as they pray and as they ask you for help. Oh, place the, the arm of omnipotence as it were in the very service of the weak, beleaguered saints assembled here at RBC and help us Help us to change and grow that you might be glorified in our lives. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 May God be glorified as we receive his word and then as we remember it, as we walk out, I'd invite the congregation to stand for the benediction. The benediction is the final words from 2 Peter. Right after he says that the Lord will return and that all this earth will be melted in a great heat, he says this, but you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and unto the day of eternity. Amen.